I'm Karen Shaneman of the Division of Nursing Homes at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'd like to welcome our satellite audience and those who are receiving this broadcast through the internet to volume three of the Nursing Home Journal, The Activities Requirements. I'm here with one of the members of our expert panel who worked with me to develop this new guidance and who will be co-moderating today's broadcast. Paula Havred is a supervisor from the Jacksonville Office of the State of Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Division of Health Quality Assurance, in other words, the State Survey Agency. Before coming to the survey agency, Paula worked as an activity professional in nursing homes. Welcome, Paula. Karen, I can't tell you how excited I am to be a part of today's broadcast to ensure that the surveyors understand this important new guidance. It was wonderful to be a part of the group of professionals who worked for over five years to develop this guidance, submit it for two public comment periods, and receiving the largest number of comments for any tag that has been revised so far. The panel is so pleased to see the guidance has become final. That's great. The purpose of this broadcast is to introduce state agency and CMS regional office surveyors as well as providers to the new guidance that has been developed for the activities and activity director requirements at F248 and 249. In today's broadcast, we'll go over key aspects of the new guidance. We'll interview staff from two nursing homes to find out how they get the job done of providing individualized activities. We'll go on location to look at some adaptations one home is using to enhance activity participation for their residents who need special assistance. We'll peek in at one of the first greenhouses in the country to see how activities and living merge together in that setting. And we'll even find out the latest about what's been happening to the computer, the porch swing, and even the bicycle. But before we begin, Mr. Thomas Hamilton, director of the Survey and Certification Group at CMS, would like to make some remarks about today's show. Good afternoon, and welcome to Volume 3 of our Nursing Home Journal series, The Activities Requirements. I'm Thomas Hamilton, Director of the Survey and Certification Group at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS. Today's satellite broadcast complements our new Nursing Home Surveyor Guidance for the Activities and Activity Director Regulations at tags F248 and F249. We believe that meaningful activities for nursing home residents can be an important contributor to their quality of life. We are therefore pleased to release a revision to the activities guidance, the first revision since it was originally written in 1992. Many changes have taken place in nursing homes since that time, and many nursing homes are making great strides to improve quality of life and the activities that they provide to residents. Such progress is particularly important since many individuals residing in nursing homes today often have significant disabilities. These individuals require a great deal of staff help to enable full participation in their preferred activities. Making meaningful activities available to every nursing home resident is a significant challenge. It requires that all departments in a nursing home work together. Today's satellite will include interviews with administrators and activity directors from two homes that are accomplishing such teamwork. We'll learn about the manner in which the goals and approaches to an activities program can fit into the comprehensive care planning process. We'll find out how activity programming may differ in a nursing home designed around self-contained neighborhoods. And we'll look in on a home that is using adaptive equipment to help residents who have problems with vision, hearing, or difficulty using their hands to participate in daily activities. We will also see some new efforts to adapt computers for ease of use by residents. We'll look at a new multi-sensory environment that uses sights, sounds, touch objects, and other techniques to create a pleasant and calming atmosphere for residents. In the process, of course, We'll go over the key aspects of the guidance itself for both tags 248 and 249. I hope that you find today's presentation useful. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your continued diligence in our mutual efforts to improve quality of care and quality of life in our nation's nursing homes. 
Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. When the panel was working on developing this guidance, some key concepts came to light. First, the activities regulations are a part of the quality of life section of the regulations, and they represent a right rather than just a care planned item to be only applied sometimes. Also, that the only way a home can possibly fulfill the mandates to provide individualized activities for everyone is if the whole home works together to get the job done and not just leave it to an activities department. We realized that residents' care plans should have goals for the resident and not goals for departments. Next, the environment itself, if it's good, can be an activity. And finally, that the activity director must not just simply be there and be qualified, but must direct the program so that all residents can receive what they need and want. Yes, Karen. Just getting up in the morning and reading the paper over a cup of coffee is a preferred activity for a lot of people in our society. But that doesn't happen in a lot of nursing homes where they're still functioning as institutions with the medical model of organizing everything for staff convenience. But hundreds of nursing homes all over the nation have been figuring out how to make each resident's day be how they would like to spend it. Let's start then with the guidance at F248 activities. Let's first look at the regulation. It hasn't changed. It says that the facility must provide for an ongoing program of activities designed to meet, in accordance with a comprehensive assessment, the interests and the physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being of each resident. That one sentence has some very important words. First it says ongoing program, meaning the program must match the residents who live there and must change as the resident population changes. And it says it's based on the comprehensive assessment, which means you can only provide for each resident what they need and want if you know them, just like for the quality of care tags. And finally it says each resident. This is quite significant as it assumes that each resident who moves to a nursing home needs to be assessed and provided with activities that meet their interests in order to further their well-being. It's true that there will be an occasional resident who is completely independent in providing for their own activities, but this is becoming quite rare in today's nursing homes. Even then, the home should realize that the resident may change their mind and become interested in some programs, or at the very least, should ensure that this resident has things they need, like pencils for their crossword puzzles, um, a subscription to the daily paper, or, or whatever else they might need. So let's get into some of the key features of the guidance. After an intent and some definitions, the first major section is the overview. This sets the stage for the importance of the activities requirement as something that is personally important to residents. The overview mentions a large-scale research study CMS conducted in the early 90s in which about 160 residents were interviewed by ethnographers about what is important to them in their lives. The residents overwhelmingly assigned top priority to dignity and listed meaningful activities as a key aspect of maintaining their dignity. The overview also makes a distinction for surveyors about homes that are providing non-traditional approaches to activities. Many of these homes are developing neighborhoods and households as part of the nationwide culture change movement. Life in these settings more closely resembles life in anyone's home with much less formalization of activities programming. Paula, how about covering key aspects of the assessment and care planning sections? Sure, Karen. Let's start with assessment. The home needs to find out for a new resident information that is specific enough to determine what they used to do, what they like and don't like, and what their needs are. This information becomes part of the resident's comprehensive assessment. All the information collected about the resident goes into the development of the comprehensive care plan, and activities is a part of it. The plan identifies the resident goals, and the approaches the interdisciplinary team will take to fulfill the goals. For example, there may be a goal about a resident's participation in a desired activity that includes responsibilities of various departments for conducting the activity, transporting the resident, and providing special food at the activity. Or there may be a goal about the resident needing to gain weight, and you may be seeing approaches that nursing, dietary, and activity staff would be doing to fulfill the goal. 
One of the other key points in care planning section is that a home may need to consider changes to the various schedules, such as those for therapy, bathing, or medication, and that's in order to allow the residents' participation in activities of their choice. We'll be asking about schedule changes when we interview our nursing home guests later in the show. Okay, the last major section of the interpretive guidelines for 248 is called interventions. It deals with various sorts of adaptations a home may need to make for residents who have various physical or cognitive limitations. Some of the issues covered in this section are visual or hearing impairments, physical issues such as loss of hand dexterity or limitations to posture or range of motion, and various cognitive issues such as lessened attention span and loss of short-term memory. The section also covers residents who don't speak the language of the facility, residents who are at the end of life, residents with significant pain, residents with varying sleep patterns, such as those who are up in the middle of the night, residents who recently moved in, residents who are at the facility for a short stay, younger residents, and residents of diverse ethnic backgrounds. The interventions section concludes with interventions for residents with various behavioral symptoms. This includes residents who are constantly walking, engaging in aggressive actions, disrupting group activities, going through other people's belongings, uh, withdrawn from customary routines, constantly seeking at attention from staff, unaware of personal safety, and those experiencing delusional or hallucinatory behavior. With us today are Susan Harris and Barbara Quinlan from the Daughters of Israel in West Orange, New Jersey. Susan is the Assistant Executive Director of the Home there and has recently served on CMS's panel in the development of the new activities guidance. And Susan is a Certified Activity Director. Susan just recently received the 2006 Widener Lifetime Achievement Award from the New Jersey Activity Professionals Association. Susan is also largely responsible for bringing a new program of care to the United States, which we'll learn more about later. Barbara is the Director of Activities at the Daughters of Israel. Barbara has been an activities professional for nearly 20 years, and her efforts have been recognized with awards from two New Jersey State Associations. We're very happy to have you both here. So Susan, let's start by having you tell us a little about your home. Thank you. Our home is 100 years old and has 300 beds. We are an Orthodox Jewish population and have approximately 450 members on staff. We have six distinct units, from very high to very low physical and cognitive functioning, including a state-certified Alzheimer's unit. Individual disciplines, including activities, are responsible for assessment and care planning on their assigned unit. Susan, I remember when you joined us for the panel when we began to review over 100 pages of stakeholder comments. What was that experience like for you? It's been very exciting to be part of this process. The work that we did will help to ensure a more comprehensive and individualized quality of life for our residents. Before the panel's work to revise the activities guidance, surveyors may not have known what was considered good practice in activities. The new guidance should help both surveyors and providers understand what an activity program should be able to provide for the resident. Barbara, how do you direct the activities program at your facility? Well, at Daughters of Israel, we have unique staffing. We have six activity professionals who coordinate all aspects of their unit's programming. They are responsible for clinical documentation for one unit, which is an average of 50 beds. We have a total of 20 full-time and part-time activity staff. I train and supervise the activity therapists, but they are in essence the activity director of a 50-bed unit. The therapists are involved in the development of all of the assessment tools. Assessment is a key section of the new activities guidance and makes the point that a good assessment is necessary to individualize activity services for a resident. What do you do to assess a new resident? Well, upon admission, the activity therapists meet with the resident within 24 hours to assess their immediate needs. Then they provide or assist with any supplies for independent pursuits such as magazines or other reading material, a radio or a TV, and a calendar. Within the initial assessment period, the therapist is attempting to engage the resident in group or independent activities. 
The therapist observes their response to assess what level of programming they would most benefit from and therefore are to be targeted for. Here are some important questions I tell our activity professionals to consider when a resident is first admitted. Can the resident initiate independent pursuits or do they need structured programming? Can the resident determine their own routine or do they need reminders and assistance? What level of programming would they best respond to? For example, small group programs as opposed to large group activities. Another key section of the new guidance is care planning and it makes the point that the care plan is for the resident, not for departments. The team needs to work together on all of the resident's problems and goals, whether they are clinical issues or activity issues. What do you do to care plan for a new resident, Barbara? The interdisciplinary team consists of the charge nurse, a social worker, the dietitian, and the activity professional. The CNAs and the rehab department also have input. Each discipline completes their initial assessment and then their section of the MDS. Though I train the activity therapists at Daughters to review not only section N of the MDS, which they are responsible for completing, but other sections as well, uh, such as customary routine, cognition, psychosocial, and mood, just to name a few. After reviewing the entire MDS, the activity professional needs to do a RAP review. To do a RAP review is to ask why is, attraction, uh, why is it triggered or not and if we want to proceed or not. We ask, why is the resident not participating in activities? Is it behavior, mood, or psychosocial? Is it physical issues? Or are we not providing the programming that they need? A decision to proceed or not to proceed needs to be made and clearly explained in the RAP note. If activities does trigger, the RAP or progress note needs to clearly state why and what we're doing about it what activity services or interventions are being provided for the resident, and where on the care plan are these interventions listed. A resident will not trigger for lack of participation if the home has merely placed the resident into whatever programs are available without regard for their interests or needs. So care planning should be considered whether or not the RAP triggered. Barbara, what do you tell your staff about the goals on the care plan? We instruct care plan teams to ask themselves after they write a goal, how will we know if we met this goal? If their answer is clear cut, then they have a measurable goal. If not, they will need to rework it. And care planning does not have to take a lot of time. If the problem is well described, then it becomes easy to write the goal and interventions. Do you have an example of clinical issues that have an activities approach, Barbara? Yes. Uh, if a resident has skin breakdown, then one intervention would be to include increased liquids during activities. For those residents who are too fed, then, resident should, then the resident should not be in the room during food-related activities and otherwise occupied, including being out of the range of smells associated with the food. For falls, encouraging participation in exercise to promote mobility and taking time of day into consideration. Some residents experience patterns of having falls at certain times a day. Now, all of the inter these interventions should be based on the individual's response to programming, if the resident will benefit from the type of activity and if they're interested and willing to participate. Barbara has used very good examples to show that the guidance doesn't require residents to have a separate activities care plan. Instead, activities are a part of the comprehensive care plan for various issues such as weight loss, falls, or skin breakdown. Yes, as the new guidance says, selected activities are used as answers to the resident's issues rather than just an answer to what activities is the resident going to be in. Surveyors shouldn't be looking just at a specific activities goal, but at the whole comprehensive care plan. Yes, that is correct. Activities or pursuit of individual interests are, par are a part of our everyday life. This is not any different for residents. Activity professionals must be able to look at the resident's interests and determine how to best incorporate them into the resident's overall plan of care. The objective is to help achieve the goals determined based upon the problem assessed by the whole team. I find that in our home, it is unusual to see a straight activity care plan. In fact, it's been many years since I have come across one. There are times, however, when I will suggest that a team develop a quality of life care plan. This involves all disciplines and may have activities as the primary focus, depending upon the issue. For example, when I was recently auditing charts, I came across a resident who wasn't eating well. There were lots of interventions for this, but none that seemed to be working well. 
the quarterly team note indicated that the resident was eating very well at activity programs. I asked the team to determine why this was happening and see if they could incorporate these foods into the resident's meal plan. The resident liked sweet foods and items that she could pick up in her hands. The team changed the care plan to add sugar to some of her foods and provide finger foods such as sandwiches or soup in a mug. The outcome resulted in the resident eating better and gaining weight. For our special care unit, I designed an old-fashioned ice cream cart. This stores all kinds of ice cream treats, such as ice cream bars or ice cream sandwiches, that are finger food and easy to eat with one's hands for the residents. The serving from the ice cream cart is often used as an intervention for care plans regarding weight loss on this unit. That's great. Earlier I mentioned that there will occasionally be a resident that is independent in pursuing activity interests. What do you do if your assessment of the resident reveals this? These fairly independent residents are now becoming our outlier population. They're a smaller percentage of the resident population. These are the residents who would most benefit from empowerment type activity programming, who we need to pay special attention to. Um, they might need assistance with community-based programming and getting out to the community or getting the community in, as well as getting them involved in leadership roles in the facility. We need to make sure that they do not have underlying mood issues, telling us that they are fine and telling us what they do all day independently, but upon closer observation, they are not watching TV or reading that pile of books in their room. Often, these residents do not feel that they belong in the nursing home. Would you please describe the types of programming offered at your home and how these are determined? How do you know what to offer? Activity professionals should have a formal process to determine the needs of the residents that is used in developing their calendar. Such systems have been called the program decision system, resident needs assessment, or population analysis. There is no one right way, process, or tool that must be used. It is only important that there is a process in place. I have been developing a process that I have used over the last 10 years or so, utilizing a population analysis based on resident participation and functional level. We do this at Daughters of Israel once a month. Uh, the lev these levels correspond to the level of activity programming that we provide. The three main levels that I use are empowerment type activities, such as the resident council or community involvement, maintenance activities that maintain functional level like physically and mentally stimulating activities, supportive type programming where the objectives are to provide comfort, solace, or stimulation. I will also consider the type of activity settings, such as one-to-one -one in small group, that would best serve the residents. So, for example, if 75% of the resident population would best respond to small group programming, then 75% of the calendar programming should be of this type. So surveyors will not see as many traditional large group programs as they're used to in that case. And then there should be more one-to-one -one programming, sensory stimulation, and small group activities. This may also require an increase in staff time needed for programming. I've included examples of these tools I've mentioned as handouts for the show. I just wanted to point out that the calendar should also show changes in the program offerings as the resident population changes. This is a good indicator that the resident's interests and activity pursuits are reflected in the overall program of activities. Well, there's a lot of information in the new guidance on uh, interventions for special resident issues such as uh, low vision or, or hearing or poor motor skills and also cognitive and behavior issues. Later in the broadcast we'll be showing some adaptations we recently taped at a home in Virginia. Susan, what do you have to say about adaptations that an activity director can use? The adaptations listed in the guidance shouldn't be a checklist for providers or surveyors. They should serve as a starting place and as suggestions or examples that could be used. As we've just been discussing, these examples won't apply to everyone. When you joined our activities expert panel, you let me in on a new concept called snoozelin. I understand you had something to do with bringing this to America. Would you like to tell us more about this? Yes. When I was working as an activity director, I was challenged with providing activity interventions to, a, to very cognitively impaired residents who were at the end of life. In this unit, everybody was very impaired and needed one-to-one -one activities. I opened a catalog and found Snoozlin found Snoozlin equipment being used in England for a population with developmental disabilities. The word is a Dutch word that means to snooze and to doze. 
Snoozlin is a multi-sensory environment that utilizes lights, sound, touch, and taste to work with residents who don't have the ability to engage themselves in any type of program or activity. So I called the company and told them that I thought this might work with nursing home residents. They came to the home and tried out the equipment. We lowered the lights and suddenly this group of residents who had been yelling and pounding were calm. We had engaged them. Wow. The Snoozle and Company provided me with some video footage. Let's take a look. In medical news, there's a new creative way, new creative therapy underway to help the, the behavioral problems of people with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. The treatment is underway at Beth Israel Medical Center in Manhattan and reaches patients through their senses. Dr. Jay Adlersberg is on call with the details. It's a room meant to delight, to stimulate, and to alter mood. The environment of lights, sounds, smell, and objects for touch are targeting four of the five senses. This is where Dr. Jason Stahl, a psychologist, treats elderly patients like Armand Hazan, who is in mental decline from a dementia and is often agitated and panicky. His son is with him on this day. The treatment is called Snoozlin Behavior Therapy. By the top. That by the top, absolutely. Good. The effect is calming. The purpose of Snoozlin is to provide a meaningful experience to the patient that they can enjoy and understand. And through that enjoyment and understanding comes meaning and well-being. Do you want to show us what you do with your design? Mr. Hazan's memory has been in decline in recent years, but creating designs with these lights helps him not only to remember, but to focus on the moment at hand. And where have you seen palm trees? In Morocco. In Morocco. So when you see that's this... How, uh, that, that, that's how I get the ID. There's also aromatherapy, which also jogs the memory. It's a lot more than just stimulating the senses. It's really doing a thorough assessment and really matching their likes and preferences. They explore and talk about touch. Then, with his daughter now present, some work on movement. Mr. Hazan's happy face is the opposite of the agitation and confusion that often plague him. He recognizes that he's losing his memory, and he, I think anything that could help him feel better about himself is, is great. Agitation is the main reason why people get institutionalized and have a really poor quality of life. And so if you can take a non-pharmacological or non-drug treatment and actually help people, it's a wonderful thing. Research in Europe has proven that Snowsland therapy reduces antisocial behavior in people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. It can also improve their mood, communication skills, and social interactions. Dr. Stahl says he'd like to expand the use of this therapy in the United States. I'm Dr. Jay Adlersberg, ABC7 Eyewitness News. That looks very interesting. I got to see some of this equipment when we visited a home in Virginia, and we'll be looking at footage from that visit later, but I'd like to know when you use the snoozle environment in your home, how do you know who would be good for this activity? Is it a session with multiple people at once or, or used for one or two residents at a time? And what does the staff do? Like every other activity intervention, residents are assessed as to whether or not they respond well to the components of or the entire program. The sessions can be used for one or two people or a group of people. The intent is for staff to dim the lights and turn on all the snoozle lights and music, then work with one resident at a time using the various handheld items and other sensory objects. While one or two residents have the attention of the therapist, the other residents are able to enjoy the lights and music and might be able to interact with the item in front of them without the therapist's intervention. The therapist is able to go from resident to resident and then start again. The items that the residents interact with are chosen based upon observation of individual responses to the items. We have seen some residents who are calm by the changing colors of the lights, some are calm by certain scents or aromas, and other, others enjoy the stuffed animals such as birds that make the sound of the bird they look like. And we identify who would be most appropriate for snoozlin using our population analysis tool. Barbara, are there other environmental enhancements your home has made to improve quality of life? Yes. 
In addition to Snoozeland, we have made the environment more engaging with tall silk trees that break up the hugeness of the room, a fireplace, and window treatments. The environment becomes interesting. It becomes an activity. Barbara, our guidance includes mention of changes in schedules for such things as rehab that a home can make to enhance activity participation. What happens at your home? At our facility, the rehab department recognizes the benefit of therapeutic activities and flexibility, and it's determined on an individual basis. I've met with the rehab department and in-service them on the therapeutic benefits of activity programming. For instance, Bingo provides eye-hand coordination, fine motor control, and number recognition. Rehab actually recommends residents to us who would benefit from specific activities as a restorative measure after discharge from rehab, especially if they are to re remain with us long term. Do you have some specific examples for us? Yes, for example, we have a 1030 program run by a family member called Life Stories. This is a perfect group for Anne, um, who recently moved in and who is legally blind. She's also very social. Uh, I found her in her room one morning when I was transporting for the program where she was waiting for the therapist. After determining that she would like to go to the program, I went to physical therapy and discussed this with them. They agreed to let us take Anne to the program if we brought her right back to them when the program was over. We also discussed that this would be a regular program on Thursday mornings and they agreed to work with her at 11.30 on Thursday mornings. Anne was delighted with this arrangement and enjoyed the program actively participating. Then we have Shirley, who recently had one leg amputated. Her care routines changed, and she was getting out of bed later due to various care issues. On Wednesday mornings, we have a volunteer-led music appreciation program. Music is very important to Shirley, and she's also very social, enjoying group programming. After her surgery, Shirley did have a change in her mood state. The team discussed her care plan and realized that the music appreciation class would be a wonderful intervention for her, but she was getting out of bed too late for the program. Nursing agreed that this was an important psychosocial well-being intervention for Shirley and worked with the CNA to ensure that Shirley is up earlier on Wednesday mornings for this program. This was a few months ago and the routine is a success. Shirley's mood has improved and in fact she recently ran for and was elected to the position of Vice President of the Resident Council. That's great. Susan, how do you involve the CNAs in activities? In our Alzheimer's Special Care Unit, CNAs are taught and then assigned to do activities. The activity therapist schedules the activities for the aides to run. The nursing department rotates this as part of the CNA assignments for the day. CNAs are cross-trained to run specific types of activity programs, and we find that this works out very well. Our CNAs throughout the building assist with the transportation of residents, and then some are assigned by nursing to stay in the program. This is true of all units in our building for things such as birthday parties or our Sunday afternoon ent entertainment programs. A number of years ago, when I was the activity director, I invited my DON to tour the units with me after all the residents were at the monthly birthday party. We found that most of the units were relatively empty and the CNAs really didn't have much to do. From that point forward, assigning CNAs to be in the room for things such as birthday parties has worked out very well. This is particularly important for residents who might not want to attend because they are worried about getting to the bathroom in time. And it isn't only CNAs who are helping out with activities. It isn't unusual to see our DON or our ADON carving a turkey in front of the residents for our annual turkey luncheons or to find me at the barbecue during the summer grilling hot dogs and hamburgers. That is wonderful. Our new guidance has a definition for the term person appropriate rather than the old terminology of age appropriate because the individual's needs and preferences must be considered rather than just their age. That means that sometimes it will be appropriate for a resident to have a doll or some other item that we usually associate with children. Susan, how do you handle this at your home? We use a number of tools at our facility, such as baby dolls, especially ones that are lifelike. Here is an example of one of our dolls. We also use real baby carriages and we use rocking chairs. We buy those that are in a locked position until the resident actually sits in them. Children's books work very well for a resident with a memory impairment. 
Books written at the five, six, and seven-year-old age level are perfect for residents with mid, in mid stages of dementia. In particular, books that discuss non-childish topics or include beautiful artwork or photographs are great to use. It's important to remember that a dementing illness changes the resident's cognitive age. I have learned that if a resident does not enjoy these items, they will push them away. <laughs> That's great. Your doll's really cute, too. So I'd like to offer each of you now an opportunity to make any closing remarks that you'd like for our viewers. Individual assessment, understanding what the resident enjoys, and then figuring out how to incorporate that into an interdisciplinary care plan to best meet the resident's needs and goals is the linchpin to successful implementation of this guidance. Not all of our activities are run by our activity staff. Some are run by volunteers and other staff, such as certified nurses aides or social workers. Activities have to be coordinated by the activity director with support from all disciplines. It takes everyone on staff to support a full and comprehensive program of activities in a facility. Mm -hmm. Activity professionals may be overwhelmed when they first look at the guidelines, but for many of us, we're already doing much of this. Our focus has been on providing individualized approaches to improving quality of life for each resident for many years. I was taught this in my basic training a long time ago. The challenge has always been answering the question, how? Maybe now, with the support of the entire interdisciplinary team, we will achieve on a large scale what the visionaries in our field have been teaching all along. We'd like to thank you both for giving us all this great information. Thank you, Karen. It's been a pleasure being here today. Thank you for having us. In a little while, we'll hear from another home, this one with neighborhoods, about how activities fits into the picture in this type of setting. But first, Paula, would you provide some information about the new investigative protocol that we've developed? Karen, I enjoyed working with the surveyors on the panel to develop this new protocol. The new investigative protocol covers both F248 activities and F249, the activities director tag. Observations by all members of the team are most important and can give you the first heads up that something is not right. If you see residents sitting around not involved, you'll need to sample some of these residents to see what the facility has planned for these residents. For each residence, the protocol begins with detailed observations. Observations on various shifts help the surveyor to determine if staff are consistently implementing the activity portion of the comprehensive care plan. For example, if a resident's care plan includes participation in some group activities, the focus of observations is on whether the staff are informing the residents of the activity, whether they are providing transportation as needed, and what does the resident's participation look like? Are they involved or are they attempting to leave, or expressing displeasure or sleeping through the activity? A one-time observation does not necessarily constitute a deficiency. Let's make sure that we are looking at the whole picture, which may involve looking at more than just a 10 a.m. or a 2 p.m. opportunity for involvement in an activity on one day of the survey. The second key aspect of the investigative protocols is a set of interviews of staff in different departments. When writing this guidance, we felt that there was a need to make sure that all staff were involved or um, were aware of what was going on with the residents' day. That's the reason for the additional questions for facility staff. There is more to learning about the activities program of the resident than just interviewing the activities director. So in addition to interviewing the resident, interview questions are provided for staff in activities, nursing, both the aides and the nurses, and social services. Talk to the resident. If the resident isn't able to express their desire, talk to their family or, their resident, or the resident's friends. For example, there's a resident I know that I'd like to call Mr. A. Direct care staff should be able to tell you what time they got Mr. A up because he wanted to be in the dining room for a certain activity. A nurse on the floor should be able to tell you if Mr. A's medication was given so that Mr. A would be able to sit comfortably in the activity of his choice without being interrupted. 
the social workers should be able to tell you if Mr. A had enough funds to go out of the facility to eat or to go shopping if he needed to. But do not limit yourself to these staff members. Therapists, dietary staff, maintenance staff, and others may give you the information that you need to make sure that the resident preferences are being followed. The third major aspect of the investigative protocol is record review. In this review, the surveyor will compare information obtained by observation of the resident and interviews with the resident and staff to the information in the resident's record. The surveyor will determine if the assessment is accurate and comprehensive. They will also determine if the care plan is based on the resident's goals, interests, and preferences, and includes any adaptations needed to be able to, for the resident to participate in activities of their choice. It's so nice to be seeing some homes starting to gear their care plans to what the resident prefers to do. And these homes are writing assessments that let the staff know who the resident is and care plans that say to the staff, this is what the resident prefers to do or did do in the past. And the activities planned are person appropriate. So our Mr. A was a tugboat captain and was very hard of hearing, probably stemming from blowing the horn too much. You would hope to see this information in the assessment. What kind of activities would Mr. A desire? He may not be able to quite understand you and give a direct answer, but maybe through family and friends, the facility has determined that he desires to sit near a window with as much light as possible. Rain or shine would not matter because he most probably did not go to sea on just sunny days. And that would be a great goal. And to accomplish this goal, the approaches may be to make sure that staff understand when to get him out of bed and which window he would like to sit by. If one day Mr. A did not want to get out of bed and appeared to have lost interest in the day, then you may see a revision in the resident's care plans. The last portion of the investigative protocol covers what compliance looks like. For each resident investigated, the facility is in compliance for that resident if they adequately assess the resident's preferences and needs, implemented activities for the resident in accordance with the resident's goals, monitored the resident's response, and revised the care plan as needed. If a deficiency is cited at F248, the protocol directs surveyors to use CMS's new Psychosocial Outcome Severity Guide contained in Section 5 of Appendix P to determine the appropriate level of severity. So reset your Sherlock Holmes hats and read thoroughly the new surveyor guidance. You are ensuring that the facility knows their residents and how they wish or desire to live their daily lives and that the facility is providing the means and the wherewithal to do this. We all look forward to surveying facilities with wonderful home-like living environments for their residents. Thanks for that review, Paula. I can see you're enthusiastic about this new guidance. I certainly am, and I think it will make a difference. Oh, I do too. to have with us Connie McDonald and Karen Dewan from Maine General Rehabilitation and Nursing Care, a subsidiary of Maine General Health in Augusta, Maine. Connie is currently the administrative director and has been involved in long-term care for nearly 40 years. 
at the Glen Ridge facility, which we'll be talking about today. Connie was previously the administrator. She initiated a culture change journey there that has earned national recognition by the quality improvement organizations. Karen serves as the current director of activities at Glen Ridge. She has also been an asset to the facility's culture change, earning the Maine General Star Award from her peers. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Karen. We're really glad to be here. I've asked you to join us for this broadcast so that our surveyors can learn more about how activities take place in a home with neighborhoods such as Glen Ridge and whether it's any different from other facilities. So Connie, first I'd like to ask you to tell us, what is a neighborhood? A neighborhood is a place where people live. It's a concept about the people there, including everyone who contributes to the neighborhood, such as the social worker, the family members, dedicated direct care staff, our housekeepers, all of us, and our relationship with each other. It's a paradigm shift that embraces people who are there as neighbors. Just like any other neighborhood, these vary based on the people who live there at the moment. We didn't do anything to alter our physical plant, it, except we did allow the staff to decorate the common areas with whimsical themes. And they have really enjoyed creating a pleasant and warm atmosphere for their, res for their residents. Our staff have dedicated assignments and are much more familiar with the little things about their residents that really make a difference to their quality of life. Oh, I see. Karen, would you like to add anything to Connie's description? Yes, thank you. The neighborhood is about families and friends in a home-like atmosphere with warmer conditions. People in the neighborhood can move freely on and off the neighborhood and interact with others. In a neighborhood, there are lots of social interactions going on, both resident to resident as well as staff to residents. The word unit has the connotation of a place where work takes place instead of a place where people live. That sounds great. Connie, why did you make the change to neighborhoods? It was a natural transformation that resulted from our dialogue about doing the right things for the right reasons and making changes that we felt were resident focused. We asked ourselves, if we lived here, how would we want it to be different? And we heard things like, I wouldn't want to be told to do things at a certain time, or I wouldn't want someone coming in and turning the lights on in the night when I'm sleeping. And our changes came a piece at a time. We also found out that some things were done at certain times because it was easier on the staff, but we weren't taking the wishes of the residents into consideration. Well, so it was the process of determining what you didn't like and figuring out what to do to make it better. Exactly. Our residents were well cared for, but we weren't recognizing the importance of relationships. And once we started to talk about these things, we all knew that we couldn't continue that way. I'd say having an open dialogue about this was the most important first step. We challenge each other to come up with better ideas, and we adopted a motto, doing the right things for the right reasons. And we put posters around the facility to inspire staff to share those ideas. We even put up what-if questions in the staff bathrooms for them to think about changes they would like. When did activities come into play in these discussions? Staff from all disciplines were part of this dialogue right from the beginning. Everyone was asked to think about what changes sh should be made to provide a better place for people to live. We talked about what the residents' daily lives were like and what they really should be like. People started asking Karen what they could do with residents who stayed up at night. CNAs wanted to know what they could do with residents right in the neighborhoods. Right from the beginning, we recognized that activities were key to the quality of life at the facility. We created activity closets and stocked them with supplies suggested by the neighborhood staff. We trained staff to be comfortable with facilitating individualized and small group activities. Activity care partners began attending communication rounds between shifts and shared ideas about engaging with residents in meaningful interactions. We took advantage of being part of the neighborhood team to educate all care partners about the value of meaningful activities and that it's everyone's responsibility. Wow. How has activities changed as you moved from units to neighborhoods? I've been at the facility for 18 years, and at the start, activities was only Monday through Friday, and activity staff did it all in the rec room. Connie worked with management team and changed this. When you visit our community, 
you now see that we have activities occurring throughout the home in the neighborhoods, in the solariums, in resident rooms, and near the nurses station, as well as in the larger community center. At any given time, you may see social interactions going on with care partners from nursing, social services, housekeeping, maintenance, or administration. Staff have moved out of the medical task-oriented model to a social model. Well, I, I've heard you've also used the term care partners a couple of times, and, and what is that? As we move further into the social model, we began to look at our language, and we realized that we didn't want to use medical model terms. We all talked about, and after several suggestions, we decided to call everyone care partners. Well, going back to that social model, what does that term mean to you? A social model focuses on the relationship between the care partner and the resident. Care partners really get to know the resident as a person, someone who has had a full and interesting life. With this knowledge, it is easier to personalize the resident's day, even while we help them with ADLs and other necessary tasks. You've mentioned earlier that you've even turned ADLs into activities. What do you mean by this? We are a dementia facility, which means staff assist with every aspect of residents' daily life. Starting in orientation, we began to talk about the fact that every interaction with a resident, even during ADLs, can create a meaningful activity for the resident. Holding hands, just spending time together, reminiscing while they walk. I conduct activity-based care training to teach staff how to make activity meaningful and to give the CNAs ideas how to turn ADLs into meaningful activities. At these trainings, there are lots of creative energy and exchange of ideas. We reinforce the idea that everyone is responsible for providing activities. We now have developed an advanced training called Life Enhancing Activities, which is an interactive process where the participants actually conduct activities. I've provided some outlines of these trainings as handouts for this show. Wow. So in a neighborhood setting, a lot of activities are just normal life. Yes, they are. Activities is not just games or providing something to eat. We constantly train on the importance of activities and, and encourage conversations in multi-groups. So the staff realize that activities is just a part of the whole. Our conversation in multi-department groups is about quality of life and how that looks. We think about connecting with the resident as they go through their day-to-day -day routine, for instance, during ADLs. And we ask the CNAs, do you sing together? Do you play with hairstyles? Do you talk about past experiences with the residents when you are interacting with the residents? And our staff now understands that what they are doing is significant to the quality of life for our residents. I'll say, it seems that in some homes a great problem is um, residents getting transported to activities. How do you handle this in your home? We've worked hard on continuing the dialogue to have a real paradigm shift toward a culture where activities are recognized by all care partners as a key part of quality of life. We inform everyone at our daily stand-up meetings about where formal activities are planned, and this is communicated back to the neighborhoods by the charge nurse. It has become an expectation for the staff to assist in helping residents go to the activities of their choice. I see. In a neighborhood, I believe you said earlier that many different staff may be providing the activities. Tell us more about that. It's not uncommon for the housekeepers to take some residents outdoors and share a cup of coffee or cold drink. The CNAs may have nail, polish, nail polishing group in the evening. The maintenance staff will ask the residents to give feedback when hanging a picture or repairing something in the neighborhood. Residents often spend some quiet time with the social worker visiting over tea. The 11 to 7 care partners often use the bread making machine to bring the aroma of baking bread into the environment. And therapeutic touch is being done more often now by staff while t talking with residents. Wow, again. Do you mean to say that CNAs receive activities training as part of their CNA training course? Yes, they do. As part of their training, they work with our department to get familiar with how to incorporate activities into their daily interactions with residents. We want them to be comfortable with this aspect of their CNA duties here at Glenridge right from the start. 
it's becoming more our culture for CNAs to have greater awareness of the value of activities. A resident participating in an activity is rarely interrupted for the purpose of a staff task, such as bathing, taking a blood pressure, or other medical interventions. Thanks, Karen. Connie, can you tell us some creative things your staff are doing? Yes, the, the housekeepers have built a welcome wagon and they give each new resident a greeting card which introduces the, them to their housekeeper. Our neighborhoods have come up with their own projects and they decorate for each season and holidays. CNAs wanted to memorialize the residents who had passed away. So they set up memory shelf where they display their pictures. We have our own version of a best friends program in which a staff member volunteers to be a buddy to a specific resident. About 80 residents have been paired up with a staff volunteer so far. A CNA coordinates this program. Our beautician sought out Karen to find out how she could make uh, the quality of residents' life better while she was with them. And we share our, their life stories with her. She now sometimes goes outside with a resident or has a snack with them in her shop. So what does the buddy do? This is based on the relationship and what the resident wants. It may be taking the resident outdoors, holding their hand, and just being there, acknowledging the resident's birthday, making sure the resident gets needed supplies for activities they want to do. There is no required plan. Okay, this sounds great. But what makes it possible for the CNAs to have time to do activities? Once we released the boundaries of the medical model, there was no longer a tight schedule to have everyone up and dressed at a certain time. The environment became more relaxed and staff were set free. This gave the staff power to show what they were really capable of doing. Our staff have stepped up and meet the high standards that we have set. Staff satisfaction and reduced turnover are results of these things happening. So what has this change to neighborhoods meant to your staff? You know, Karen, we constantly receive testimonials from staff about the things they do and the impact they have on their residents. Sometimes these things are shared with tears because the interaction was so special. Our families know who the dedicated CNAs are and they are very appreciative of the caring interactions they witness. This has resulted in ideas for positive change flowing freely from lots of departments. This has also resulted in higher job satisfaction and several other positive statistics. For instance, our turnover rate is about 30%, which is lower than previously because we used to run around 50%. We also have not used agency in over a year. This is because our staff has, have not been calling out because they feel a connection to the residents and a responsibility to their role. Nursing leadership makes it a neighborhood pride issue and excessive absenteeism is addressed with the individual really early on. CNA callouts dropped 37% in the six months from May to October in 2005. There were only 48 CNA callouts in October and that re represents over 1,200 CNA shifts. We have reduced staff injury rates to to rates that are phenomenally low, which is amazing given that CNA injury rates are one of the highest in the nation. Staff accidents have also dropped from 122 in 2003 to 94 in 2005, and lost work days dropped from 127 in 2003 to 13 in 2005. That's because we have an aggressive program to bring to people's attention that the company cares about them. We implemented a stretching program for everybody. We have a follow-up program for injuries and a back-to-work program. And we have education programs for proper body mechanics. And we encourage our staff not to do certain things alone. When the staff feels important and valued, they really contribute. Great. And Karen, what's been the reaction of the surveyors to the way you're providing activities? When the surveyors are in our facility, they can't say enough about the atmosphere and also about how the staff seem to show genuine care and really know their residents. We don't feel stressed by them. We just continue on our daily activity plans as if the surveyors aren't in the facility. We feel comfortable with what we are doing. The surveyors say that the facility seems very caring and they are very impressed with how much the residents are engaged. 
They also have noticed that the staff seem to really know how the residents like to spend their leisure time. Yes. And, and I talk at the entrance conference with the surveyors and tell them about the atmosphere we are creating. I explain that if a CNA is spending time with a resident in a meaningful activity, I don't expect the bed to be made by 9 a.m. I talk about what our neighborhood culture is and how we are moving away from that medical model. I tell them that not all residents will be up for the breakfast service, but we'll have breakfast when they do get up. We also try to develop a respect an open relationship with surveyors when they are in our facility. That's good to hear. Uh, in fact, it's good to get the information out to surveyors at the beginning of the survey on a routine basis and explain what you did and why you did it and even the results, if you have any. In fact, I would think it would be a good idea for homes that are just starting out to make contact with their survey agency to explain ahead of time what they're planning to do. So do you have any parting comments for the providers in our audience? Yes, I do. I would like to say to everyone that every interaction with the resident opens the door for a meaningful activity to occur. It is up to all team members to be flexible and to keep themselves open to these possibilities. The relationships that develop are key to enhancing the quality of life in a facility. Providers should lead frequent discussions on how would I like it to be if I lived here and let the staff get involved in these conversations. Encourage the staff to be involved in coming up with and trying out new ideas. It's okay if the ideas fail sometimes. Administrators should pose the questions and facilitate that the conversation moves forward, but mostly get out of the way. By that I mean empower others to make the decisions and you really will get the great results. For DONs, I would like to tell them that they will not give up good clinical quality in order to have a social relationship with their residents. The two are compatible and actually will result in better care, better staff satisfaction, and better resident satisfaction. I would also say that you have to tell staff that sitting and talking or doing something with a resident is a good use of their time, as this isn't so in the medical model. However, if the administrator and the DON do not show passion around this, there won't be any change. All right. Hey, I'd like to thank you so much, Karen and Connie, for sharing this information with our audience. You've taught us many new ideas, and we surely wish you great success in all your endeavors. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. I'd like to move on to a home we visited recently who agreed to show us some adaptations they're using for residents with various physical issues. This home also was using snoozel and equipment. Let's take a look. We have a few different adaptations for folks that are in wheelchairs. We have a lovely garden that we use for a number of different things that includes a garden swing that's very reminiscent of when folks used to sit out on their porch and swing and, and talk and pass the afternoon and evenings away. But this one is unusual and that's it, it's wheelchair accessible. And it has a very nice gliding motion that's very smooth and very relaxed. And we also 
have many paths that our family members and residents love to take strolls along the paths and just spend time out there listening to the birds and looking at the fountain, enjoying the beautiful flowers. We also are getting very soon a duet wheelchair bike, um, which will enable folks who are in wheelchairs to once again enjoy the pleasure of being on a bike and being in the outdoors on a bike once again. Inside the facility we have equipment that's also wheelchair adaptable. We have a combination pool and ping pong table that is used frequently by folks who are in wheelchairs or who are ambulatory. Well, we have a reading machine that anybody in the facility that has problems with low vision can go to the reading machine and it enlarges the print and magnifies it to whatever magnification that they need to be able to see clearly. So if they want to take a Reader's Digest, if they want to take a letter that they got from family, they can take it to that machine and use it. We have a stand-up garden vessel that enables people to, to continue to garden and do what they love. We also have a putting green with an electric ball return. There's a great resource that we have. It's called a die cut machine. And we're able, the residents are able to make greeting cards. They're able to make envelopes. We're able to do special invitations with precision cutting with that machine. We do have quite a bit of equipment that we use here to help residents interact in their environment. Sometimes residents lose the capability of interacting in their environment by themselves without assistance. We have a multifaceted machine here to create a snoozeland type environment and this machine incorporates all of the different senses. So for example we have a, a bubble tube that changes colors that's incorporated into that machine, some very lovely fiber optic showers, also auditory with the different cassettes and music we can use. Uh, it also has adaptive switches and also we can diffuse different fragrances into the air while we use that machine and it also has different projector wheels that we can use and display things onto the, to the walls or onto the ceiling at the same time. We also have some equipment that mocks bird songs. We call it our bird song machine. Um, we use it to create a very pleasing, relaxing atmosphere where residents might be listening to the sounds of their favorite birds while getting a hand massage, for instance. We also have sensory stimulation kits that we use. Uh, the staff use those with residents in groups. We use those with residents in individual times with that resident. Volunteers use the sensory stimulation kits when they come to visit. An example of the different themes that might be in the sensory stimulation kit, we have one that's a patriotic theme. For our gentlemen, we have uh, history. We have uh, military type of things in the sensory stimulation kit. We have one that's a big hit with the ladies that's a baby sensory stimulation kit that actually has a baby doll and a, a baby doll puzzle and videos about babies. Karen, there are some exciting new activity options available these days. Yes, I, I really like the bubble machine and so did our crew. I could hardly tear them away from filming it. And although we didn't get to film it, this home actually has their own TV station that broadcasts in-house programs daily. I understand that residents host daily shows and others run the cameras. That sounds like an interesting activity. And Paula, I've run across a couple of more activity interventions that this home plans to implement. Let's look. This is Catherine. Before her stroke, Catherine was not a computer user and there's not one at her home. But in this environment, with a large button keyboard, a touch screen, and with the support of a helper, Catherine can connect with her brother, her son, and her pastor by email. 
She has toured museums by way of the internet and seen art that she otherwise might have missed. And even though she cannot buy a card at a store like she used to, she can still send a loved one a meaningful greeting with a card she helped make herself. Alrighty, you need to find, first of all, your little um, screen page. And then you're looking for your picture. Very good. It's working. Good. You're going to use the mouse. And we've got over here, create a project. And that's what we're going to do is create something from scratch. And that leads us to this list of many choices. Okay. Here's our picture. This is going to be folded in half. We're going to fold it very carefully so we get it just right. Okay, thanks, Robert. You are such a dear and a wonderful cook, and we forgot the comma. Robbie does have computer knowledge, and he has a computer at home. He's comfortable working in this lab alone, trying to come up with the best solution to catalog his personal movie library. The computer like allows him to stay Florida. engaged. But this is beautiful. I come in here every morning at 9 o'clock, because I don't have nothing else to do. But on Mondays and Fridays, I take PT, which lasts about five minutes. Then I come in here and get on the computer. Everything is computerized. This is Ima Jean. Her stroke paralyzed her on the right side, and it greatly affected her speech. But she still has plenty to say and people to talk to by email. When she's asked to read her email out loud, her thoughts are more manageable, and she can get the words out. Will you read that for me? Texting by the email. I am looking forward to having a great time. Another program available with the IN2L system helps with physical therapy. This device is a SIM cycle. The cycle can be operated with hands or feet. The benefit comes from the physical operation of the cycle, but also in the fun factor. There's also benefit in the act of typing. The large button keyboard takes out the intimidation factor that would keep a non-typist from writing. What about those who are losing their cognitive skills? For times when traditional computer applications aren't appropriate, some people with dementia can still be engaged. A familiar face can be turned into a multimedia piece and easily accessed by touching the screen. The role of the activity professional is dramatically changing in senior living communities. IN2L systems encourage creativity above and beyond what has been available in traditional settings. Engaging group activities, traveling the world through cyberspace, stimulating games, connecting residents with their friends and family are all examples of how IN2L systems can provide sophisticated options for older adults in all stages of life. The Duet Wheelchair Biking Program. The Duet is a specially engineered bike that blends the wheelchair and the bicycle into a mobile type of therapy. The front of the Duet is a detachable wheelchair that serves as the front wheels of the bike. With the fresh air surrounding them and the sun beaming down on their faces, residents of all functioning levels can enjoy the thrill and freedom of riding along a park pathway or through gardens, sanctuaries, or wherever the heart desires. Seated behind the resident on the pedaling portion of the duet, the therapist can control the speed, braking, and turning of this unique piece of recreational equipment. This marvelous piece of machinery is engineered and fabricated in Germany and has undergone rigorous testing for safety. Karen, I've actually seen pictures of the bicycle getting ready to be used in a community setting. And I think the computer adaptations are a great idea, too. Yeah, it seems that way to me, too. A little later, we'll take a look at the newest type of nursing home environment, the greenhouse model, and see how in that setting activities merge completely into life, into real life. 
But first, I'd like to cover the main points about our other newly revised TAG guidance, that for TAG 249, Activity Director. This new guidance makes some key points. First of all, the 249 regulation has not changed either. As always, it concerns the qualifications of an activity director, as well as the responsibility this person has for directing the development, implementation, supervision, and ongoing evaluation of the activities program. This includes, of course, the responsibility for assessing residents and working with the interdisciplinary team to develop each resident's goals. And it includes the management of the whole activities program, including determining what activities to make part of the program, monitoring the responses of residents to their activities, and making necessary revisions. Usually tag F249 is not reviewed unless problems are discovered with activities at F248. Paula, how about covering the key aspects of determination of severity for F249? Okay, Karen. There is new deficiency categorization guidance that includes some specific examples of what constitutes the different levels of severity for deficiencies at this tag. For example, the guidance states it is unlikely that level four immediate jeopardy would be cited at this tag, since it is unlikely that the failure to have a qualified director managing the activities program could put residents at risk of serious harm or death. For level three actual harm to be selected, you must have noncompliance at level three for the activities tag F248, and there is no qualified director, or the director fails to assure the activity program was implemented. Level two reads the same as level three in that there have to be both a deficiency at F248 at level two and either no director or the director isn't doing their job. Level one is a special case. The language of the regulation must be met or a deficiency must be cited at F249. So if that language is not met, for example, there is no qualified director, but the activities program is okay and there is no deficiency at F248, then F249 should be cited at level one severity. Thanks for that information. I hope that surveyors will find the new severity guidance helpful. Paula, have you ever seen a greenhouse? Only the kind where I go to buy flowers. I like to see one though, and I've heard of good things about them. So would I. Let's look at some footage from a tape of residents moving to the nation's first greenhouses in Mississippi. We're getting ready to move. And as I am a lazy person, you can see it takes a lot of people to do it. It's just like I'm moving home where I came from, you know. It, it feels like that, you know. I'm going to be free. <laughs> My mother, Mildred Adams, is a resident in Cedars nursing home. She's had the opportunity to come here to the greenhouse. And uh, it's a great thing. We're excited about it for her. But in her condition, I wish it could have happened sooner, three or four or five years ago, maybe. She's been in nursing home care since 1999. To Charles Adams and his wife, Becky, the move to a greenhouse is a wonderful opportunity that has perhaps come too late. Mildred Adams' physical and mental state has deteriorated to the point where she no longer feeds herself, seldom speaks, and seems oblivious to the world around her. Hey, good right, <laughs> Got you a brand new place, and you can just go out to the kitchen and anywhere you want to go. Woohoo! That's the difference in the greenhouse. People are coming there to live, not to die. And we believe that anybody, regardless of frailty or mental capacity, uh... still can continue to grow. And that's what the greenhouse does. It's an environment that enables that growth. You smell like good cooking there, dude. I'm, I'm glad that you're really good. Good. Uh, you're cooking you a good meal. When you walk in the door, you smell breakfast cooking. Uh, you smell the coffee. We want the aroma of the food to come out. Well, that's why we're constantly having some baked goods. Because aroma goes through, it makes them hungry, it increases their appetite. They eat better. The kitchen is a gathering place anymore, and even so, with these homes, I, I see the elders gathering around the kitchen, hanging around the counter, just watching, asking questions. The green smile. She's smiling. They sit down at the family table. 
They talk about what happened during the day. We serve them the soup, then we dump the soup, we clear it, then we serve the next. There's no hurry that says, fine, you got to be done by 12.30, I have, I've got to go do something else. Within an hour of the move, at her first meal in a greenhouse, Mildred stunned her son by taking the spoon away from him. I started out feeding her while I go, you know, because she fed, you know, for like several months, but she took the spoon away from me. She did? And she started feeding herself. Great. Had a good meal. That's just what we're thinking is going to happen here. <laughs> She's doing this. She has not fed herself in wet months, really. And today she wounded it. It's amazing. Mildred continues to feed herself and is speaking more. You got any of this hot? Okay, you want sugar or cream? Such improvement is common in the greenhouses. We had an elder here named Ms. Stubblefield. She hadn't been out the bed, and now she's up and in her wheelchair, and she's in here every day when we're cooking supper, and she's talking about her recipes, and it's just wonderful. The ones that were in wheelchairs are now walking around. It amazes me. I love it. Mm -hmm. I, their smile on their faces, the expression on their faces are totally different. Totally different. What's one of the things that you like here? Well, uh, I, I like it all, but it's so convenient for me, you know, me being blind. It's just plain nice. Everything about it is great. Oh, I think it's beautiful. Heaven <laughs> on earth. You know, I never had nothing like this in my lifetime. I like it because it's... <laughs> I think that is just amazing. I never realized that the environment made such a huge difference that when you move people into a setting that is just like home, they can be not only much happier, but actually much better in their level of functioning. That was really heartwarming to see. Oh, Karen, I too agree that this is amazing. The look on the family members and the staff faces just takes my breath away. What a good place for the residents to be, a place they call home. Well, this has been quite a lot of material. We've gotten to see so many new and exciting things. And to hear of the wonderful work some homes are doing to have all their staff work together to help each resident have a wonderful life. For those who would like more detailed information about the new guidance, CMS has placed a PowerPoint training file up on our internet site that contains not only slides, but instructor notes. I hope that not only survey agencies but also providers will take a look at this training product as you introduce this new guidance. Paula, I'd like to thank you and all the members of the activities panel for your hard work over the last five years and your dedication to residents in nursing homes. Karen, I'd like to speak for all of those who spent time on the panel. We all feel like the final product is going to ensure a better quality of life for all residents living in long-term care. We are looking at a changing environment in settings that have moved beyond home-like to really being home. Yes, home is the key to quality of life. To those who have tuned in today, thanks for watching.